pues. Can you hear me? I'm having uh, technical issues. I'm not understanding what's going on. Um, technology in Uganda. If you can hear me, you can uh, put it in the comment section. That I get to know I'm not talking to myself. So we are looking at uh, eating disorders as psychological illnesses defined by normal eating habits that may involve either insufficient or excessive food intake to the detriment of an individual's physical and mental health, or you can also define in terms of how the people with these conditions present, whereby an individual experiences severe disturbances in eating behavior, such as extreme reduction of food intake or overeating, or feelings of intense distress or concern about their body weight or body shape. Okay, you're hearing me loud and clear, so we shall proceed. So eating disorders are frequently appear during adolescence or young adulthood, but some reports may indicate that these conditions can actually develop earlier on in childhood or later on in adulthood. So as much as they appear at certain age, they can also appear. I have an stable internet and I hope it stabilizes. So they cannot either appear in later on in adulthood or earlier on in, child, in childhood, but the typical age of onset is during adolescence or young adulthood. So most people with eating disorders are females although some eating disorder actually also occur men as well. The only exception that occurs more in men is binge eating disorder, but the rest commonly occur in women. So when we go to look at the etiology, the exact cause is actually not known, uh, but there are different mental, physiological, you know, or psychological issues that may be responsible for these eating disorders. And these have been determined through research. So one of those, some researchers are suggesting that there could be uh, genes that make certain people more vulnerable to eating disorders. And this has been also confirmed through some research showing that if you have a first degree relative with this condition, then you're also likely to have it. So that confirms that genetic link. And then there's also some evidence that certain immunotransmitter may, may be responsible by causing eating disorders because you know certain influences eating behaviors. Okay. Uh, other factors are biological factors, uh, whereby some biological theorists are suspecting or suspect certain genes may leave some people particularly susceptible to eating disorders. And consistent with this model, is this research that have, has observed that people with eating disorders are six times more likely to develop, rather relatives of people with eating disorders are also several times more likely to develop eating disorders as well. And the risk has been observed among twins, whereby monozygotic twins, the risk is 23% if one of the twins gets the disorder and then 
we see that at least the risk is reduced in the amount, uh, uh, rather in the diazygotic twins, or we are observing bulimia being 9% compared to 23% in the monozygotic twins. And these findings are, so related, are also related to serotonin levels, which are lower in this population. Okay, you can call them what you want, disorders or clear. That's what I'm, I'm seeing people, you know, putting up there. Oh my gosh. Other biological factors, we are seeing some theorists also believing that these eating disorders are related to the dysfunction of the hypothalamus. And researchers have been able to identify two separate areas that control eating. So one of those is the lateral hypothalamus and then the ventromedial hypothalamus, which are responsible for weight set point, which you may call it more like a weight thermostat that helps kind of controlling hunger. And this is set by genetic inheritance and uh, early eating practices. But this mechanism is responsible for keeping an individual at a particular weight level. So when people overeat and become obese, it means this mechanism is no longer working. So if weight falls below the set point, then you're going to get hungry, decrease metabolism, and you may actually end up binging. But if your weight rises above that set point, the, the hunger decreases, metab metabolism increases. That's what the ideal should be. So when you find yourself overeating and gaining weight or not eating and excessively losing weight and your body isn't responding, it means that thermostat is no longer working. And uh, we find that dieters end up fighting against themselves to lose weight because they are fighting to set their own balance beyond what the body mechanism is working at. And I think that's why many people, including me, fail dieting. Other factors responsible for eating disorders, we have the social cultural factors. Let's look at this from the perspective of the Western world, where the modern Western culture environment often cultivates and enforces a desire for thinness. Look at those magazines, you look at these women, and you're like, mm, how do people you know, become like that? So young people, when they look at that, they get influenced and they want to look the same way and then they end up having eating disorders. But also looking at the Western world, they tend to make their success and worth on how thin somebody is rather than their inner capabilities. The other reason are those peer pressure issues and what people see in the mid period, they desire to be thin. This common occurs among young girls. You sure I don't want me to meet you? You need to meet yourself and stop making noise, right? Okay. Are we together? We have questions. You put them in the chat. What is in the chat? Before this guy is called this. Uh, so we are looking at that in addition to the modern Western culture reinforces the culture of thinness as well as uh, looking at self-worth in terms of how somebody, how thin somebody is. Then of course peer pressure and what young girls see in uh, magazines and other things can influence them to have eating disorders. Uh, we also have social pressures. Uh, we have the social accepted against overweight people may also add the fear. You know how people 
in societies feel those who are overweight. So people fear that they, they don't want to be stigmatized and looked at in a different way. So that fear alone makes people get preoccupied with their weight and then end up developing an eating disorder. At the moment in the Western world, if you look at the USA, you may find that 50% of, of those in elementary school and 61% of those in middle school are actually already dating at that age. And that's how bad it can be. Uh, so, so still at the attitudes may explain economic and racial differences seen in prevalence rates of uh, you know, eating disorders. We in the past, white women of higher socioeconomic status ex expressed more concern about thinness and dieting. And these women had higher rates of eating disorders. For example, if you compare those with the uh, African-American women, maybe it's still happening. If you go to the US, you're going to find the African-American uh, uh, you know, obese compared to the white women, although you also find white women being obese as well. But in the past, it was more pronounced. The differences were much clearer that white women looked thinner and African-American women were obese. And uh, recently, dieting and being prepared with food, along with rates of eating disorders, are increasing in all groups. Then we have environmental factors. Uh, so in addition, these other society and other issues and biological and physiological issues, we are looking at also environmental factors. And in this case, we are looking at where you grow up. Uh, the families may play a very important role in developing of eating disorders. We are finding that as half of their families with those people with eating disorders have long history of emphasizing thinness, appearance, and dieting. Then uh, we also see that mothers of those with eating disorders are more likely to be data so they influence their own children and then their children may not be able to handle the pressure and end up having eating disorders. So the environment can play a big role. So these are already explained the environment factors and dysfunctional family dynamics, but let's we'll look at professions and careers that promote being thin and weight loss. For example, you're looking at uh, ballet dancing, diving, gymnastics, wrestling, and other things like those a long distance runners. If you're busy, you cannot fit in it. You'd be ridiculed, you'd be laughed at, so you have to fit in. And so to be able to make it in that world, you have to be thin. Others, even TV presenters, then we have models that desire to be thin. Somebody's going to be called beautiful because they are thin. I have never appreciated and understood that definition, but that's what it is. Other issues in the family include abnormal family interactions and forms of communication within the family may also set the stage of an eating disorder. For example, if you're always critiquing how you look, you put fat here, you, you look you know, fat, you look all the things, then this may set the stage for an eating disorder because somebody is trying to fit in. I hear comfort is beautiful. I don't know who she is. This, so these patterns may include over-involvement and over-concern about other mem family members' lives. So when you have this family that they're always concerned about what other people are doing, how are they looking, how they dress, and other things, uh, that can, you know, sh should I say confused? Not really confused, but influence that individual to look a certain way and the result can be an eating disorder. Other risk factors include being female. If you look at teenage girls and young women, they are more likely to have eating disorders compared to young men and boys. Then so also age, we're looking at the early 20s, preschoolers and compared to young adults, rather than older adults and young children, the, the adolescents and early, those in early 20s are likely to have eating disorders. Then, of course, we talked about family history, as already explained. Other risk factors are more psychological, so you have emotional disorders. People who have depression, anxiety, 
and obsessive compulsive disorders are likely to have eating disorders. You can write in your comments why you think somebody who has depression or anxiety is likely to have an eating disorder or even that one who have obsessive compulsive disorders. Put in the comments, why do you think those people are likely to have eating disorders? Then of course dieting. People who lose weight are often reinforced by positive comments from others. Hey, you look good. What have you been doing? Then if they have been doing something, the positive comments reinforce them to do more and uh, maybe they reach a point and they are not able to control and they're likely to have an eating disorder from something that started as dieting. Probably to be healthy or something like that, but then they end up having an eating disorder because the comments are reinforcing, they feel good about it, then they overdo it and then they lose control. Then we have transitions. Maybe you're heading to college, maybe you're moving to a different town, you're landing a new job, or maybe it's a relationship breakup. Uh, all these changes can bring emotional distress, which may increase your susceptibility to an eating disorder. You can put your comments on why when you're heading to college or why do these transitions can actually predispose you. Kind of how, for example, a relationship breakup, how does it bring about you having an eating disorder? Then of course, sports, we talked about other sports, talked about rowing, talked about ballet dancing, gymnastics, but we also have actors. Yeah, I talked about television personalities, dancers and models, all those are at risk of having eating disorders. So somebody saying that I think the depressed have eating disorders like binge eating. Uh, binge eating because they have nothing to do. Does depression cause binge eating? Uh, then another one says a depressed person may find joy in food. Sometimes they don't eat the food grown, they do a lot of snacking, that's true. Then the hormonal changes occur during transition and change of environment, maybe. Effect of cortisol levels, stress. So stress causes high levels of cortisol. Yes, somebody can end up like that. But the depression, of course, causes emotional disturbances. People begin to doubt who they are. So they want to change to something they think the world is going to appreciate. So either they get bulimia nervosa, which is kind of overeating, or they may get anorexia nervosa, which is not eating at all. Uh, somebody's saying in MDD, there's appetite for food. Not always. Sometimes there's increased appetite if you have a typical depression and you can actually have, either way, you could have anorexia nervosa, but you can also ha have bulimia nervosa, or you can also have binge eating and then become obese. Because in that case, when people are stressed, especially in depression, food becomes a source of comfort. And food won't complain anyway. So they eat, they feel that's the only thing that accepts them. So they find comfort in food and then they can end up like that. So look at that a relationship breakup. You start blaming yourself. Maybe I say, probably it was my fault. Maybe it is because of the way I look. Maybe I needed to change. And before you know it, you have lost control. You're either binge eating, bulimia nervosa, or maybe it takes the other turn, you're over dieting, and you end up having anorexia nervosa. <laughs> Somebody says sometimes they eat because they think, they feel as if there's nothing to lose anyway. Not really like that. It's an emotional issue. It's not a matter of feeling. No, It's an emotional issue, and sometimes they don't control it. We shall leave the comments at that for now. So we are going to start with anorexia nervosa. And these two pictures are looking, you can see this is like a quarter slice of whole wheat bread and then a glass of water. But even that one is scaring that person. She cannot stand eating it. She's wondering if I eat late, one not type, you know, put on some cages. So she's struggling and struggling. She just can't make a decision to eat. Then on the right side, right, left side, this person is thin, but when she looks in the mirror, she looks at a fat person. So those are distorted feelings and perceptions of skin.
when somebody says eating is just eating, what do you mean you can elaborate on that? So uh, diagnosis of anorexia nervosa, according to DSM-5, one is that there is restriction of energy intake relative to the requirements leading to significantly low body weight in the context of age and sex. And then there is also intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat or persistent behavior that interferes with weight gain. We shall be seeing how. There is also a disturbance in one's body weight or shape, persistent lack of recognition of the seriousness of the low body. So even when they have really lost weight, they still insist they are fat, like the previous picture that I showed you. She's really thin, but when she looks in the mirror, she sees something bigger than who she is. And when you do this diagnosis, you can specify by saying restrictive type, or it could be a purging, stroke, binging, eat, binge eating type. This is how they look like. You see that picture? And you cannot convince them that this is so bad, like they look like they're going to drop dead, or they look like a skeleton, they will never believe that is the truth. So this is a picture of a true patient treated somewhere. It can be this bad. So, so the subtypes, the restricting type, in this case, during the last three months where somebody is manifesting these symptoms, the person has not engaged in recurrent episodes of binge eating or purging behavior. So what these people do with the restrictive type is they restrict food intake period. That's it. I'm not going to eat and I'll lose weight. On the other hand, the binge eating purging type, during the last three months, the person engaged in recurrent episodes of binge eating or purging behavior. Now, purging behavior is I'll eat all the food that I want. But after eating the food, I'll get rid of it. So I can use laxatives. I can induce vomiting. I can have enema, I can do all sorts of things, but the solution is this food cannot remain because if I leave it in, I'm going to gain weight. So they will eat, but they'll find ways to get rid of the food. That's how it differs from the restrictive type. However, no matter how much they are eating, because of these compensatory behaviors, they still lose weight and they are below the expected body weight for their age and height. You can keep your comments in the, sec uh, in the section, chat section, and uh, I'll look at them way later. So these are just pictures to show you how bad it could look like. And these are people they are calling it beautiful. You see that picture on the extreme right? This is probably a model somewhere, and they are that she's beautiful, or she thinks she's beautiful, but she's actually finished. This one has this muffin or cake, whatever it is. She wants to eat it, but then the thought of eating it is too unbearable. So she rather puts the tape on her mouth not to eat. This other person, this is how he looks like, but he thinks he's this big, so he's perturbed by how he thinks he's fat. Anyway, to cut the story short. So other behaviors, in addition to the worry about food and weight gain and uh, misjudged perception of the body and weight, they are preoccupied with food food recipes or cooking, and they actually do cook elaborate dinners for others, but they don't eat themselves. And when they get to the table, they'll cut their food into tiny pieces, you know, turn around the fork here and there and the knife and never eat the food. And they don't really eat around other people because their behavior around the table uh, embarrasses them. And uh, other behaviors include hiding or discarding food, and they perceive themselves to be overweight, despite being told by others that they are too thin even to move around other people. And the other behaviors to look out for is that while on the, at the table, they will run out to the bathroom. And what are they going to do there? To throw up, induce vomiting, to get rid of the food that they have eaten, so that they don't gain calories. And then, of course, other thing you're going to observe is this intolerance to, to cold their temperatures are usually low. So the epidemiology is that the lifetime prevalence of anorexia nervosa ranges between 0.5, 3.7%. This depends on where you do this research. For example, in Uganda, we have not done 
this kind of research, so we may not know. And among girls ranging from 14 to 18 years, we are looking at the prevalence of 0.5 to 1%. And uh, when look at anorexia versus bulimia nervosa, anorexia is about 30% compared to 50%. And uh, death can also occur, yeah, up to three, up between eight, rather three to eight percent of people have died from these conditions. It, age occurrence can range between 10 and 30 years. And the risk is especially when somebody goes through stress. And as we said earlier, it's more common in women. You can see the ratio is one to 20. And then think of these other professions that predispose people to these conditions, modeling, ballet dancing, actresses, and other people like that, television personalities and socialites maybe. So when you have this, this disorder, you restrict food intake, you starve yourself almost to death, you're also going to have, you're going to have medical complications. So I have death can occur because of hypokalemia, starvation, and maybe sudden cardiac arrest. Then you have hypometabolic issues, but the cardiac hypotension and hypothermia, dehydration, arrhythmias, and heart failure, bone loss, periphery demand, other things that you're going to observe. Some of them even have brutal hair, which is brittle, which is you know more like the baby's hair. And uh, on recovery, they may also have a refeeding syndrome, which can be dangerous as well. Uh, so this picture is really to show you how each and every bit of your body may be affected by anorexia nervosa. I'll send you these notes as well, and you'll be able to see what I mean. And then you can be able to advise people accordingly. Treatment, it has to be multidisciplinary. You cannot see, uh, say that I'm a psychiatrist or manage, or I'm simply a physician or manage your issues. No, N usually you need a doctor who may, not even one doctor, you may be a psychiatrist, another physician, because you are seeing a lot of complications. You need a therapist from the psychological point of view, but you also need a dietitian to assist with how to introduce food advice about food and uh, you know, set meals that are restrictive of the normal weight. So the first thing you do is to determine if the patient requires any patient management or you can treat as an outpatient or maybe a dead patient, dead treatment, where they keep coming to the health facility and uh, you see them, maybe they go home or you can say come every week, once a week or something like that. But the team must be multidisciplinary because these people tend to have multiple issues and one you know, doctor or one therapist or one dietitian may not manage. We all need to put our resources together to be able to manage this person. So to begin with, you need a psychiatrist. You need a therapist for individual to address personal issues, but you also need a family therapist to address the issues within the family. Then, of course, you need a nutritionist. The first thing you think about with these people, it is waste, weight restoration. Let them have some food in their body. The second bit, you think about psychological issues. What is it that got them to that level? And the third one is maintenance. So after putting you back to normal, how do we maintain that to make sure that these conditions do not occur again? Okay, so basically psychotherapy is the best evidence form of treatment for these people. And uh, for young people who live with their families, you need to look at the family as well. For if they are married, then the spouses and other family members may have to come in. The philosophy of managing this condition is that you don't blame. You don't apportion the blame to, every, to anybody in this family. To the patient, it's not her fault. 
to their family, it's not their fault either, but they all have a role to play in that person getting better. So don't blame, bring them together, let everybody know their responsibility. If they are young people staying with their family, empower their parents to do whatever they can to get this person back to normal and appreciate the role of food in their life. If they are married, let their spouses play a role, or maybe they could be doing something that is pushing this person to that level. If they have grown up children, which is probably unlikely, but everybody must play a role in there. And once weight is restored, you need to go back and explore the family dynamics and the psychological issues that may be ongoing in that family. Medications really don't have a big role to play. But because we say that people may have underlying psychological issues like depression and anxiety, that's how we may come in to bring some medication like antidepressants. And in this case, we prefer to use the SSRI, so Prozac or Proxetine, that is the other name, is a better option for depression and anxiety in these people. Where they are thinking, and interpretation of who they are has gone into a different direction, sometimes we may end up giving them a low dose antipsychotic. And olanzapine is the best choice for these people because it helps with weight gain. However, you need to get their consent on if they actually want to gain weight or not. So it's a little complicated, but these are some of the medications you think about, but you have to discuss with the patient so that they understand they are conditioned, that means you store insight, and then they can appreciate the outcomes of this treatment. When you look at the prognosis of anorexia nervosa is that 40% uh, recover, 30% continue with a milder cost, so they never recover completely, while another 30% are chronic, they never recover at all. And the risk of death is higher from these three conditions, suicide, cardiac arrest, malnutrition. And if somebody has lived with a condition for three years or more without treatment, the prognosis is likely to be poor. So before I transition to bulimia nervosa, let me look at your comments. How about somebody who eats a little but grow fat? Have you seen someone like that? Let me go backwards, then I see this comment. Some of them are funny. Displacement activity, they channel the breakup into eating, yes, but you're also blaming yourself in that case, thinking, somebody broke up with you because you don't look your best or maybe you're ugly or maybe so you turn to food you turn to dieting but then you can lose control along the way because you're not doing this with a clear mind you're doing it under stress ocd patient team may attempt to neutralize the comparisons by eating which may involve into eating disorder kind of but then when you think obsessive compulsive disorder you think about perfectionism People who, are, who have OCD are, are perfectionists. So they want to look a certain way, they want to maintain certain looks. So that's why they are at risk of eating disorder to maintain that perfectionism. At what stage do we draw the line between someone having just high or low appetite and an eating disorder? Having a high or low appetite and an eating disorder. The question is, why do you think you have low appetite or why do you think you have high appetite? Two, are there psychological issues that you think are affecting your eating habits? Three, are you obsessed with how you look? Are you worried about weight gain? Do you, when you look at yourself, do you see a distorted image of what you truly are? Once you start noticing those things, it ceases to be high or low appetite because you're consumed by how you look, you're consumed by the food you eat, about the food you eat, you're consumed by thinking about body weight. So once those things happen, you know it's no longer just a matter of I have low appetite or I have, have high, high appetite. How about 
Oh, my internet is getting unstable again. How about the fellas that engage into eating competitions? That's a one off thing. I wouldn't call that one a disorder. But if they do it more often, then we may end up calling them to or fitting them into a group of binge eating disorder. If it occurs more often and it's affecting their way, the way they look, they, they're obese, then we are going to group them into binge eating disorder. Are there studies in Africa documenting the prevalence of eating disorders? No, you can start by being one of those. Is being a foodie an eating disorder? Whereby someone can eat just anything rather as food. The question is how much do you eat? You could like food, but you don't eat too much beyond what you're supposed to eat and health does not affect the way you look. It's not making you a beast. You're not eating abnormally. You shall be looking at bulimia eating disorder then you differentiate between being a foodie and then having an eating disorder. With binge eating, don't victims feel full? We shall look at that. They eat until uncomfortably full. They can't control how much they eat. They eat too much food in a, you know, a single sitting that other people cannot eat during that time. Is eating a lot to become big and eating disorder? Hey. I don't know what that means. Eating the lot to become big. Why would you want that? Can fasting lead to eating disorders, especially among some regions? I think no. This one is just, this reminds me of the story of the great musician who lost lots of weight and came out say that her life was never the same after a long time. Yeah. I, I know how she looks like, she's scary. It, it, is it an eating disorder when a person chooses one type of food and eats that only throughout? Does it got all the nutrients? The question is, why are you choosing that only type of food? If you choose only that type, then there is an issue there. How about someone who is naturally thin? Whether they eat a lot, they just mean thin. The question is, how thin are they thin? Are they more like a skeleton we saw in those pictures? There's being thin, but then there's abnormally being thin. If you're eating food and you're looking very thin, you have something physiological or medical going on, you should go for a checkup. How about someone who eats little but grow fat? That's my story. I can't explain it. <laughs> You should exercise, it means you have low metabolism anyway. So in this case, you need to do more of exercise to increase your metabolism. There are certain types, rather there are certain sports like rugby where players are advised to eat a lot so that they have certain killers to be able to play a certain position. That's not binge eating disorder because they are eating for a reason, but they're also exercising, so they are not obese. What brings about variations in eating behavior? I mean, sometimes one eats a lot of habit other has lots of appetite, but other times, if it, if it is for women, I'll link this to hormonal changes. About men, I'm not sure. If the question is coming, they are, they are actually very interesting. So bring me a nervosa. Meanwhile, I hope you hear me. If you don't hear me, put your comments in there so that I get to know. So these pictures indicate See how this person is really eating a lot. And after eating, she will go to the bathroom to get rid of the food. That's been a nervosa. But it is different from the binge purging type of anorexia nervosa, and I'll tell you why. So looking at the diagnostic criteria for bulimia nervosa, one, that they have recurrent episodes of binge eating, including eat large, eating large amounts of food in a discrete period of time, lack of control over their eating, then B, they have recurrent compensatory behavior in order to prevent weight gain, and C, binge eating and, and inappropriate compensatory behaviors at least once a week for three months.
my internet again had gone off, but we are back. So let me share again. Today is the worst day possible. We have experienced this in a long time. Bremia nervosa means hunger of an ox for nervous reasons. That is something picked from a book. That's literally that, that it means. So Bremia nervosa is characterized by cycles of binging, meaning eating a large amount of food and then experiencing guilt, fear, stomach discomfort. And then the, the person who eats the food goes to purge. But those who suffer from non-purging type compensate for binges by exercising. So there's either purging, excessive exercise to get rid of the food. A person with bremia eats a, a lot of food in a short amount of time. And hence, that's why it is called binging. And this binging causes feelings of shame and guilt. Although the person kind of has no control over the binge eating behavior. So the person tries to undo the binge eating by getting rid of the food through these purging behaviors. And the purging behaviors, I talked about them earlier. They include excessive use of laxatives. They basically abuse laxatives. Enema, of course, self-induced vomiting. Uh, maybe diet pills these days, and there are a lot of diet pills on the market. And uh, excessive exercising. The lifetime prevalence of this condition, of course, it's more common in women. You can see 1.5 percent of 0.5 percent, and uh, binge purge behaviors observed in 13 percent of the girls and 7 percent of the boys. And the signs and symptoms include chronic gastric reflux after eating, because I mean they induce self vomiting. So that's why you're going to have that. There is dehydration and hypokalemia due to frequent vomiting. Oral trauma, you're going to have a lot of tears, a lot of tears in the mouth, even in the gastric area as well, a lot of uh, lacerations in the throat. Gastroparesis or delayed emptying, constipation, and for women, they also tend to have infertility, resulting from lack of nutrients in the body, anyway, and then interference with the hormones. Medical complications uh, include electrolyte imbalances, dental, where you have lots of enema, chips teeth, and dental cavities, parotid enlargement, because they're always forcing, so they tend to have those enlargements, conjunctival hemorrhages. I think you can read why calluses on the other side of the hand because they're always putting their hands in that prone position, leaning on either a sink or table, whatever it is to throw up. They may have esophagitis, hematemesis, and then of course they are laxative dependent. This should be laxative, not the tea should be, I'll remove it before I say. This is another picture that shows how every bit of your body may be affected because of the behavior of these people display. Treatment, as we said earlier, the same story. We require a multidisciplinary team. And uh, in addition to that, cognitive behavior therapy plus antidepressants, especially the SSRIs, very good combination to help with this condition. Therapy, as I said earlier, medications have no to play in these conditions. So therapy is the thing that you should think about. And uh, still, as we said for anorexia nervosa, if majority of these are young people living with their families, so the whole family should be involved. If not, there are young girls living with their boyfriends and their boyfriends may be the cause of this stress. So get them involved but also to interpersonal level, do interpersonal therapy. As an individual, why do you rely on other people to define you? 
So interpersonal therapy helps these individuals find themselves, define their boundaries, and do make psychotherapy. And this is good for long-term results, especially when people have underlying depressive symptoms and personality issues. So you try to uncover what went wrong at a certain stage. And they need to face their fears and worries and live a normal No. The question is, how much do you eat of that edible thing? If you eat too much, yes. I don't know how conjunctival hemorrhage comes about. And then somebody said conjunctival hemorrhage relating it to increase intracranial pressure, which may lead to ruptures. Yeah, it's very right. I, yes, doctor has network issues. <laughs> I really have network issues today. My rock isn't working, lake and mobile isn't working, so I don't know. Where do we put ladies who take a lot of water and they keep on this to get drunk, not to get drunk? This is not an eating disorder, though, but it's another bad habit that people may have. Okay. It's not an eating disorder. So psychodynamic psychotherapy, of course, nutritional plan, exercise and physical activity. I hope you can hear me. I'm back with my weird internet of today. It's unstable though, don't know the reason. Medications, uh, high doses of fluoxetine are known to improve bulimia nervosa. Sertraline is also another antidepressant, some good evidence. We prepare on another antidepressant. This is contraindicated because it causes seizures, especially if there's history of purging. Topilamate, a mood stabilizer, promotes weight loss. So it's a good one to use, but you should be uh, used in caution because now people are Today, I feel like ending this lecture and we leave it at that. My internet has really, really disappointed me today. I have meetings for hours and this never happens. I don't know. Prognosis, about 33% recover or get into remission. Other 33% get into full remission after, yeah, after treatment. But there is a uh, 1% risk of death also due to this condition and mainly due to complications. So binge eating disorder. Somebody had a question on binge eating disorder and I think we shall solve it in here. So diagnosis of binge eating disorder needs three of the following. Eating much more rapidly than normal, getting uncomfortably full, large amounts of food when not physically hungry, Eating alone because they're embarrassed about how much they're eating and feeling disgusted by themselves about their eating behavior and everything around the eating behavior and the amount of food. Depressed, but also guilty over the overeating behavior. So uh, the DSM-5 criteria needs this, your eating, but in a discrete period of time, too much food. There is no control over the eating behavior and binge eating occurs on average at least once a week for three consecutive months. If that happens, because somebody was asking about rugby players, they don't do this really, so it's not binge eating. And uh, binge eating disorder, of course, as we saw in the previous slide, that they are consuming large quantities of food in a very short period of time, and they are eating until uncomfortably full. 
And uh, although binge eating is much like bulimia nervosa, now people with bulimia nervosa compensate to lose weight. And for them, they remain in the normal weight of, as expected for their age and height. But people with binge eating, they eat and all the food stays in, hence the risk of obesity, like this picture we see here. There's no use of laxity, there's no fasting, there's no safe use to vomiting. All you eat will stay in, you are at risk of obesity, as this picture of this person that you see. And the behavior is weird. You see this woman in the fridge, like she's being chased. She's holding too many things. Everything they see, they want to put in their mouth. Somebody was saying that every time they see food, they get angry. You eat like this. If not, you don't have an eating disorder. And binge eating disorder is the commonest eating disorder. 3.5% in women, 2.5% in men. But overall, this condition tends to be more higher in women compared, rather in men compared to women. Treatment, uh, SSRIs have been shown to reduce binge eating behavior in the short term, but they don't help with weight loss. So other means must come in to help that person control the weight. And convulsants like Topomax and Zonisamide, which, which have mild mood stabilizing effects have been known to help as well in, uh, in uh, reducing the binge behavior, but also with weight loss. But as I said earlier, you need to use these drugs with caution, otherwise people are going to misuse them. And therapy is also necessary, where my therapy must prioritize binge reduction and weight loss. And then group therapy may work because if you get people of the same condition, they can motivate each other to get over this habit. And uh, there's no evidence to show that obese individuals who binge should receive a different type of therapy from other eating disorders. So it is the same thing. You need to break the cycle. The motivation that puts you into eating should help you overcome that. Somebody has disorganized me by becoming your host. Oh, gosh. I don't understand you guys. Pretty much that was the end of the, uh, the lecture. Let me see if there are comments in there. What is normal eating? No, no more eating is no more eating. You eat amount of food that you expected to eat, right? You don't eat until uncomfortably full. You don't eat too much at the same time. You don't uh, purge. You are not worried about your weight and obsessed with it. You are not wearing, uh, rather, weighing yourself several times a day. So that should be no more eating, right? What are the best medications for weight loss? There is none. Maybe the medication is uh, eat, reduce the calories and exercise. That's all you need to do. Any other question? You can unmute and uh, ask a question if at all. I didn't understand this over uh, today. Uh, Dr. Any question, comments, you can put them in. Yes, you can unmute and ask a question if at all there is any. Somebody said thank you, and thank you for being there with my weird internet today. It wasn't easy. I don't know why. Some days are bad, some days are okay. What is the difference between bulimia nervosa 
and purging type anorexia nervosa. Yes, so let's repeat that. Now, anorexia nervosa, they worried about food, they eat too little, they look, they eliminate types of food, especially those which have fat in it. They also eat too little, but even when they eat too little, the purging type is that in addition to eating little, they go ahead to get rid of the food, either through vomiting, through fasting, exercising, or laxatives. And as a result, they are below the expected weight for their height and age. On the other hand, brimia nervosa, which has purging as part of it, even when they purge, because they eat too much, they still remain in the, in the expected weight range for their age. Does that one make sense? You know, somebody has put themselves there as Maraca's ex. Gosh, you guys are very funny. But overall, thank you for appreciating the, 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 the lecture. And uh, it's something that we, we don't take serious in our setting, but it's something that happens commonly. So if you are looking at young people, they're going to be looking up to you as a doctor, you identify them and assist them to be who they are supposed to be. If there are no any other questions, I'll let the lecture end at that. I'll share the audio, just put the pieces together because I was on and off. And then I'll share the notes as well.